Two little mice fell into a bucket of cream. The first mouse quickly gave up and drowned, but the second mouse, he struggled so hard that he eventually churned that cream into butter. And he walked out. Amen. Welcome to Successful Dropout. This podcast is for the outliers, the innovators, the rebels, those that dare to dream and act on their dreams. I'm your host, Kylan Ginger. Join me as we find out what it takes to drop out, grind, and succeed. What's up, fam squad? I've got some pretty exciting news. If you listen to the podcast much, you know we've been building a pretty vibrant community of truly, truly extraordinary people who have committed to an unconventional route through life. The Successful Dropout audience has been growing a lot, and I get a lot of people reaching out to me now with all sorts of questions regarding education, dropping out, opting out, entrepreneurship, resources, networking, etc. So much so that I decided it was time to create a more accessible community on Facebook so that we can all ask and answer these kinds of questions together, as well as celebrate our successes and encourage each other during um, inevitable adversity. So I've created a closed Facebook group, and I want to invite you to join it. If you follow Successful Dropout, if you resonate with our philosophy and want to help me grow this thriving community, go to SuccessfulDropout.com forward slash group. This community is for the rebels, the outliers, the innovators, the doers, and those who dare to dream and act on their dreams. If you're a dropout, an opt-out, if you're thinking about doing one of those things, if you're a parent, even if you aren't any of those things and you graduated school, I want to invite you to join. All that matters is that you resonate with the successful dropout philosophy and that you enter the group with the intention to provide value to the other members and not just receive value yourself. Again, go to SuccessfulDropout.com forward slash group to request admission. Once you're a part of the group, introduce yourself and get involved and I'll see you there. What is up, successful dropouts? Get stoked because today on the show we have Zachary Babcock. Zachary is the author of Prison to Promised Land, a book he wrote on his five-year experience in prison and how anyone can find happiness and fulfillment in life even after the loss of loved ones, drug addiction, and spending years in prison. Um, Zachary is now an inspiring transformational speaker and life coach. He inspires lasting change in countless lives through his unique story of overcoming adversity and the lessons that he learned through his experience. Uh, Zachary also owns and runs his Facebook advertising agency to help entrepreneurs, online business owners, and small business owners market their message to sell their products and services. So, Zachary, man, that's the intro I have for you, but uh, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you do? Right on, Cal. Thank you, man. I appreciate being here. Ah, Absolutely. Very excited. Right on, man. Very excited about this. And this this fits right into to with what I got going on, successful dropouts, because <laughs> the growing up, I just could never pay attention in school. It could never hold my attention. And I was always told, oh, you got ADD or ADHD or ABCD, EFG, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> right. uh, it it just couldn't hold my attention, and and I and I guess it stems from I, I'm an entrepreneur. It's in, it's literally in my DNA. Like everybody in my family is an entrepreneur, and I, I literally have to be interested in something to give it my full attention. I can concentrate just fine on things that really interest me, but when you're talking about the history of the Wild West or calculus or something, then I'm not really <laughs> going to use it in a practical everyday to day situation. It just doesn't interest me. So, so I'm excited to be here today, man, and, and, and excited to talk to this community here specifically. Uh, and I'll kind of go through a little bit of my story, and if I get to talking too much, just say, hey, man, <laughs> uh, keep, keep, keep on track here because I get sidetracked a lot. But yeah, I grew no, let's up, do it. <laughs> right on, right on, man. So uh, I grew up here in Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, I know everybody that like has a bad like idea, images, whenever <laughs> right. you think of that. But that's a lot of the media, man. It's it's really not as bad as as the media. It's not nearly as bad as what the media hyped it up to be. That's that's nice to know, actually, though. <laughs> <laughs> right on. It's, it's actually a re- <laughs> yeah, definitely. Man. It's actually a really nice neighborhood and good people there. But you know, yeah, we won't yeah. get too too much into that. But uh, yeah, I grew up in Ferguson, Missouri. Um, my father passed away when I was seven, and I was raised by my mother. And every single day for my 
for of her living life, she would tell me you could do anything you put your mind to. And she borrowed that belief in me when I didn't have it in myself, like literally and, and believed in me and, and gave me gave me that that uh, that belief in myself. It was huge, you know, and uh, growing up, I wanted to fit in with everybody because uh, I didn't have a father figure. So I, I wanted to be liked by everyone, which is really unhealthy and something that, you know, you, no matter how good of a person you are, you can't be liked by everybody. Right. And I. And I this carried over to me, carried on over. Uh, I started smoking weed when I was nine years old, uh, hanging out with my sister. She, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> yeah, it was crazy, man. Uh, I was wanting to fit in, and I, I started hanging out with my uh, sister and all her friends. She was three and a half years older than me, and she hung out with you know, people that were older than her. Uh, and I wanted to fit in, so I started smoking weed, and this lasted all the way up till I was about 17. Uh, during the course of this time, never stayed in school, can never hold my attention, was skipping school, just being a, a rebel. I was a rebel without a cause at the time. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I ended up uh, by, by the age 17, I, I started selling other drugs and uh, ecstasy, and then I started using it. Then that led to cocaine, and I started using that, and then that led to heroin, started using that. And it eventually led to crack. I was smoking crack, like literally picking up crack crumbs off the carpet in motels and stuff, just completely not where I wanted to be in life. And a lot of people say, you know, depression or, or a lot of these mental mental and emotional illnesses are caused for whatever. But really, the, my belief is that it's it's caused for, due to the fact of not having a, a meaning, feeling that your life is meaningless. Hmm. And to, to say drug addiction is a disease that's that's complete crap all right at least for me i know that is because that's just give it that's enabling someone to continue to u- use the drugs and stuff for me I, I people try drugs for all different sorts of reasons to experiment to fit in and be accepted social pressure you know it, all these different reasons but they only continue to use them because they feel like their life has no meaning to it they have no purpose and that's exactly what it was with me. I didn't have any. I didn't have a purpose or, or a sense of direction in my life. I felt my emptiness. I didn't feel like I was doing anything of significance, and that's the reason why I continued to use these drugs. And that all changed when I did find my purpose. And we're gonna we're gonna get there. But uh, so I was just had no purpose at this point in time in my life. I I, I had caught some cases one night before. This is before I started doing the drugs. I had caught some cases because. I was 17 years old, and me and my friends thought it'd be cool to go rob some cars, uh, just stealing stuff out of cars, and that <laughs> led to, yeah, being knuckleheads, and that led to ste- uh, that people would leave their garage door openers in their car, so we'd hit the garage door opener and then drive off and then come back, and if it was still open, we'd go steal the stuff out of the garage, just being idiots, and we ended up stealing a couple cars, and we got caught and we got a burglar, a burglary first, uh, burglary second, uh, in stealing a motor vehicle charge, and I was put on placed on probation, and that's what kind of led me, you know, to start dabbing with the drugs, selling those, and then eventually using it, and became a full blown crackhead and heroin junkie at the at the time. And uh, like I said, I felt my like my life was over. I had these charges. I thought, oh, I was doomed. I was going to prison, you know. And if you've never been to prison, you think of prison as like what you see on TV, you know, like <laughs> Bubba with the soap and all this stuff, you know, <laughs> like it's some horrible thing, and you just feel like your life is done. That's how I felt. And, uh, and again, how old were you? I was seventeen at the time, and and seventeen to nineteen between this this span right here. Went went to prison when I was nineteen, but. Start the caught the case at 17, then started using the drugs, and by 19, actually got sent to prison. Uh, but yeah, I was just dude. I had to, I thought that I was done for, that there was no light at the end of the tunnel, that I was doomed, and that I screwed my life up, and there was no way to get it back. Just in a hopeless situation, and I I ended up getting sent to prison for on a seven year sentence. I had to pull four years flat. And during this time, uh, I still wanted to be accepted by others and, and fit in. So I was like getting all the tattoos, you know, and, and hanging with the with the, the hardcore convicts, whatever. Um, yeah. Just just try, trying to fit in, man. And and one really uh, big like life changing experience, one a big big uh, defining moment in my life. I was two years in 
of my four year stay and I was 21 years old and I was in the hole, which is the prison inside of the prison. There's like literally very little to no human interaction. You get three meals a day shoved in through a little chuck hole in your door hmm. and three, sh- three showers a week. And you're in a dark little cell and it's nasty down there and it's just depressing already as it is. And, uh, Gosh. I get called back. Yeah. I get called back to the captain's office and i I had to stay down there for two weeks i I mean two months and i was two weeks into this two months stay down in the hole and i get called back to the captain's office and i get pulled back in in handcuffs and shackles you know and i'm thinking you know i'm 21 i was trying to be like the the bad guy or whatever you know trying to fit in and, and be in this fake image that i wasn't you know and trying to put out that that I was, I was trying to be somebody who I wasn't. So I go back there and I think that somebody told on me for something that I did that I haven't gotten in trouble for yet or something happened and they're trying to get me to tell on somebody. <laughs> so uh, I go back to the captain's office and he's like, uh, have a seat, Mr. Babcock. And I'm like, for what, man? I don't have nothing to say, man. I'm down here for two months and you guys got to put me back on the hill, you know, kick rocks. <laughs> and he's like, you know, me trying to be the tough guy and stuff that I that I clearly wasn't. But, uh, right. <laughs> and uh, he said, Mr. Babcock, you know, when you come to the captain's office, it's not good, right? And I was like, I don't care. I don't, I don't have nothing to say. I, I mean, I'm down here for two months. Put me back in my cell. And then he says, uh, Mr. Babcock, we received a phone call and your sister passed away over the weekend from a heroin overdose. Your mother just let us know. Oh, and man, man, dude, like... Uh, instantly dude this tears started flooding out my vision was like like you know that little how you get that tunnel vision how everything goes black to like a little tiny circle and stuff it's yep. <laughs> it was it was crazy I, don't, I can't explain that feeling and they they gave me a 30 second phone call to my mother afterwards like 30 seconds literally Jeez. timed 30 seconds she's like you can't even say all the stuff you need to say in 30 seconds you know when you just lose a sister and your mother lost her, lost her daughter and stuff you know and I felt big enough to sit on a penny and swing my feet from it because I wasn't there to be there with my with my mother, you know, to to help her get through that. So I asked them to put me back in the cell by myself uh, for the next three days. I didn't eat, didn't get out of my bed, just laid there and cried. You know, I, I mean, just literally laid there. I, I, it was it was horrible. And <laughs> on that on that third day, I woke up and I was like, you know what, man. I'm still breathing. I'm still here for a reason. I don't know what that is, but but I'm here, and I and I, and I I gotta find some type of purpose here. I, I I'm here for a reason. This is I'm meant to go through this for some reason. I don't know why, but there's some reason why I'm here. So I started uh getting into this routine, and uh, every day after we ate lunch, I would immediately start cleaning my cell, and I I we we were given. Three three showers a week, so and we had two bathing towels. So I took one of my bathing towels and ripped it up into a bunch of mini rags. And I took one of these rags and I'd scrub my wall and another one for the sink, another one for the toilet. Then I'd get down on my knees and and sweep the concrete floor with my bare hands. And then I'd take my final rag, get it nice and soapy, and and wring it out on the floor. And then I'd scrub the floor until it was squeaky clean. And I'd feel feel good, you know, afterwards. I, I was living in a clean environment. And immediately after that, I'd do a, it, any type of calisthenic, burpees, whatever you can think of that you could do in an 8 by 10 cell. <laughs> right. I would get my workout in and, and just I'd feel good, get the natural endorphins flowing through the body. And then I'd flood uh, myself with books. And there really, <laughs> really wasn't much of a choice. We had old western books that really you know i i couldn't grab my attention or we had the bible so i chose to read the bible because it was feeding my soul at the time i I needed some source of positivity to 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 feed myself at that time and and towards the end of this two months stay i found a peace of mind in a very very dark place and it was like the most peace i've ever been up until that point in my life it was the most peace i've ever been with myself It, it was crazy like i got out of the hole went back on the yard and you know he around all these other negative people and they're complaining about the guards being petty or how hot it is outside or whatever and mm-hmm. i'm sitting there being thankful for these three meals i got and i see a a bird you know and i'm like appreciating the nature and, and yeah there is birds that fly in there they say the only birds that f- are in jail are jail birds or whatever there, <laughs> there ain't no birds there's that you actually see nature and stuff but uh you know i was just appreciating all that and and that was a uh, a big uh 
experiment, uh, big defining moment for me in my life. Uh, and so it kind of put things into perspective, but I did two more years of prison time and I came home at 23. I went away when I was 19. When I went away, we had flip phones. When I come back, we had these <laughs> smartphone things. <laughs> it yep. was, it was anxiety, man, bro. I, I, I literally asked my friend like the first or second day I got home, uh, asked him to use the, the phone to call another friend and he hands me it. And I'm looking at all these different apps. I don't even know what they were, though. And I'm like, I'm, I get all like this anxiety feeling, like nervous. I'm like, dude, I just want to make a phone call. How do I do that? <laughs> <laughs> he started cracking up and and showed me and stuff. So that was a, an adjustment in itself. In itself. And wow, <laughs> right? It was it was a totally different world when I came home after four years. But you know, I, I, I adjusted everything and uh, I was doing good. Uh, you know, but now I'm I'm, I'm 23. Went away when I was 19. So everybody's doing the bar thing and that's my first introduction to it to the bar scene and i i would drink socially but i wasn't like overdoing it or anything and i got a job at, at one of these bars in the neighborhood in ferguson and was working as a cook as at, at this bar and grill for 50 to 60 hours a week doing that for about eight months and um just working all the time got a girlfriend and everything was going good uh, you know uh and then i got a job at this clothing store at this mall by by where I stay, and I was really good at it. I was their top salesman, and I got promoted two weeks into it. And so I put my two weeks in at this bar and grill, and then a couple days after that, they come back, and they're like, yeah, Mr. Babcock, you're a convicted felon. you got to kick rocks. See you later, buddy. And I'm like, really? You know, like I just I, – I had some stability in my life. I thought everything was going good. You know, I was your best salesman. I get the promotion, and now you're telling me because I'm a – convicted felon I gotta go so that hurt you know but instead of you know keeping my chin up and searching for other opportunity I chose to throw a pity party and feel sorry for myself and I started drinking heavily and uh that that led to me catching a DWI and then a few months after that I was locked up uh for, for, I was down in Ferguson at, at a bar it had a complete blackout alcohol induced blackout woke up in the uh, city of Ferguson and found out that I was heading back to prison for a parole violation, and this was 20 days before my twin sons were born. Oh, jeez. Yeah, man, that that was another defining moment in my life. Like, you know, you, you hear a lot of people a lot of a lot of people talk about when they had that aha moment, like that that mm -hmm. turning point, like that 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 moment where just everything shifts, everything changed. Like for me. That moment right there, I instantly, my, my mindset has never been the same since then. It's 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 not about me anymore. It's not a selfish mindset. It, it's like I have a purpose. I mean, I have two of my my living living flesh and blood that are that are depending on me. You know that I have to take care of, and I'm not going to be that guy that's not going to be a good father, not be in their be in their children's life. You know, and I. Right. I'd, I had to miss the first eight months of their of their life, you know. I, I didn't get to see them get born, and I was in prison. But I, I had it fixed in my mind. There was a resolve that I was going to get out, and I was going to do whatever I had to do to be a part of their life and, and to be able to provide for them. And I did, had no idea how I was going to do it, but I just knew that that's what was going to happen. No matter what, nothing was going to come between that. Mm. And uh, when I when I came home eight months later, I started uh, searching for a job right right away, filling out five to twenty applications a day, seven days a week, and getting nothing, zero results. And uh, that went on for about a month and a half. And then I was introduced to a home based business opportunity in network marketing. And uh, at the time, I never even heard of network marketing, so you couldn't even scare me off with the word pyramid scheme. <laughs> it was just, <laughs> I was just like, hey, it's an opportunity, let's do this, man. And uh, <laughs> Yeah, and I, I, I did that for about two years. I was able to create a $2,000 a month, uh, almost a $2,000 a month income within the first six months of doing that. Mm -hmm. And that's not like, oh, my God, rich or nothing. But for a guy like me, like that was a game changer. I was able to, you know, yeah. survive, you know, and, and, and take care of my family. So that's what kind of that's that was I'm forever grateful. And I'm not in the in network marketing anymore, but that industry like I've always been an entrepreneur, but that was like the first legit like entrepreneurship thing I've ever done. You know, selling drugs, that's not legit, you know, or, or 
hustling Pokemon cards. It's not really legit, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, <laughs> this this was and and it also um, uh, opened me up to personal development. I had a mentor in there, and I started. They got I, I never read books before, except for when I was in the hole and stuff like that. I I, I never just read books on on the regular and. And just, my mentor got me reading books, uh, and that opened me up to the personal development, and I started growing, and it started giving me more building on that purpose and passion. And and eventually, about two about two years into it, though, I uh, I just I didn't have the passion for that anymore. I didn't have the pur- like my purpose. I, I ended up writing the book, the Prison of Promise Land book, because uh, a friend inspired me to do that, and I, I when I when I put that book out there and published it on Amazon, that kind of sparked more of like, man, I I want to I have a story that I that I know I can help people with, and it's not just the story. Like I have been through certain things and processes that I can break down and teach people that I want to show, you know, and 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 show that hey, it doesn't matter what kind of adversity you face. Like you can use your adversity as as strength and power to actually move you forward and not keep you held back. And so that kind of led to, you know, I, I, I started doing the YouTube and the personal branding thing and and I just fell in love with it and it just felt right. And in the beginning of this year, I took the financial haircut. I said, you know what, I'm going to go all in on this because this is, I know this is my calling. Uh, and I stopped doing the network marketing, uh, forever grateful for that industry, but I just took that financial haircut, quit getting the residual income and just went all in on what I'm doing now with the, with the serial entrepreneurship, the the life coaching, that the running the Facebook ads, the, the uh, YouTube content creation, all that. I just it's 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 something bigger than myself, and I know that I'm contributing to society by by helping other people. I feel like that's what my true purpose is, and that's where I'm at today, man. Well, man, that is that is quite the story, and I appreciate you sharing that. It's. I mean, it's definitely a unique one, and I mean, we've had people come on and and talk about adversity and and some of the more of the low points in their life. But I, you know, I'm not sure anything to to this extent. I mean, there's definitely a lot that you've you've obviously come back from. And I mean, as you were sharing, I I definitely noticed. You know, it seems like the two the two pivotal points for you, you know, centered around. Um, people you loved, you know, your, your sister passing away. And then, you know, of course, when you have had your kids. And so I I was wondering if you just briefly, you know, I was just curious to hear you maybe expound a little bit more about, you know, what was it about those two instances internally, you know, in you that really made the change? do, Do you think? That's a, that's a really good question. And no one's ever really asked me that particularly before, and you know I got to think about that really because they're both different, but they're both same in the sense. And and you just gave me insight on that because in both instances it was about some other people besides myself. Like the loss of my sister, like that was that that crushed me. You know, like I I, I my sister passed away. I'm never gonna see her again. No goodbyes, nothing. Not gonna be there for a funeral. But even what mm-hmm. hurt more was the fact that my mom, you know, had to find her in the bathroom with a needle in her arm. Like, you know, I, I felt that pain that my mom was going through. I mean, I, I don't know what that felt like. I didn't feel probably even a, a, a quarter of what she really felt, but I just knew that she was in, in pain and that I couldn't be there. And that that really opened my eyes up to like, you know, this heroin thing. It's not going to do any do me anything any good except for either leave me to where I'm at right now in this prison cell are to where my sister's at in the grave because because of an overdose like so that's what that it kind of made me become better and that really helped me you know fi- start appreciating the smaller things the, the the things in life that we we take for granted it, it i stopped doing that as much i started like appreciating just all the small things and then with uh with my with my sons being born and missing out on them like that that was even more hard on me because you know i wake up and i'm like dude i wanted to be selfish and go out and party and and get drunk and say i was just gonna party until my sons get here and then i was gonna figure it out after they got here well now i landed myself back in prison and i'm gonna miss them being born i'm not gonna be there to help support my right. wife you know my she was my girlfriend at the time but my wife uh, i'm not gonna be able to help support her you know i was being completely selfish and 
I, you know, I lost my father when I was seven. And so that's like a big thing for me. I want to be a, a huge part of my son's life. I want to be there and, and, and help guide and teach them as much as I can, you know? And it's so they both were really different, but I internalized them, you know, it, it, it's different situations, but I, I feel like they, I wouldn't take as crazy as it sounds. I would not change anything because it makes you who you are today. Everything that's happened, I wouldn't change anything because it was part of the process. It's part of the plan, and I really believe that you grow from these situations. Right. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. It seems, and that's what I meant is those two points seem seem to have been catalysts for for where you are now. That you know, seemingly maybe without them, you you wouldn't be where you are. You know, I'd say what it sounds to me like is you know with with your sister is more that sort of just gave you. It caused you to have more appreciation, appreciation for for life, maybe a bit, you know, more more perspective on maybe how precious life is. And, and with your kids, it seems to be more like, you know, there's a responsibility there. Um, you know, I'm I'm their father. I've got to be less selfish. You know, I can definitely understand that. I just I wanted to just point that out because I, I you know I don't know if you've heard sort of the the quote or analogy of, you know, two, uh, you know, a guy, t- two brothers, you know, one's alcoholic, one's not. And, you know, one brother says, I'm, I'm an alcoholic because my, my dad was an alcoholic. And the other one says, I'm not an alcoholic because, because my dad was an alcoholic, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard that before, but you know, it's like, there's two, there's two ways you could have gone. Like you could have just said like, screw it. Nothing good is, is ever happening to me. Um, and just continued to go downhill or you, but you know, fortunately you made the decision you did. I don't know. I I just know like for various people when they come to an event like that, you can kind of take it one or two ways. You know, you can decide to be an alcoholic because you know, your dad was or decide to to live a better life because you know, so that's, that's, that's awesome, man. And there's something else you, you had said earlier, you know, you're talking about um, how you felt like you were turning to things like drugs and stuff more because you had no purpose. Um, yeah, I can, I can definitely, I can definitely understand that. Um, I'm reading the book right now. It's called the and for people listening, uh, sorry for the language, but it's called the subtle art of not giving a fuck and you know, I'm reading it for the third time and he's talking about happiness and how happiness in life is not this thing that's passively bestowed upon you. It's, it's something that you actively work for. Like it's, it's an action. Um, uh, and what happiness is at the root is solving meaningful problems to you. It's, it's solving problems that are, are good to you. Um, and, uh, in other words, I think finding a purpose, finding something to build, something to to struggle with that that you find purpose in, where you're constantly sort of solving problems and bettering those problems that you're solving, and that seems to bring you know happiness. Or the other side of that is, you know, if you don't find that that meaningfulness in, in what you're doing, you're much more tempted to turn to forms of pleasure like drugs or alcohol that are just really temporary, really you know instant gratification. I mean. Every human being in the world is trying to find happiness and avoid suffering, you know, at the, at the same time. But, um, you know, Definitely I, 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 I wondered if you wanted to speak more, more to that, um, you know, about uh, just about purpose and, and meaningfulness and, uh, you know, how to find sort of your, your meaning, you know, in life. Do you have, you know, any, any words on, to that extent? Oh yeah, man. That's one of my favorite things to talk about right there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> definitely, man. Uh, that's one, that's one of the main things I, I like to teach people is, is about purpose, finding your purpose. And sometimes that you get that aha moment sort of like I did and then just know, and then it just changes everything. And also sometimes it just takes a while to find it. And, and it's always going to be that aha moment once you finally find it, but it might take weeks days years even to find it to find your actual purpose but uh i read a similar book and i've got to get that book because you're you're the third person i heard talking about that now in a short amount of time Mm -hmm. yeah dude i i definitely gotta check that out 
Uh, it reminds me of this book that I read, uh, uh, A Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Oh, yes. Uh, yep. Dude, that's that's another good one. Uh, mm-hmm. And and I, I love his quote in there where he talk, He says, uh, uh, the number one motivational factor in man is the striving to find a meaning to life. And I'm like, wow, you know, I mean, that's so true, though. Like, uh, we if we don't feel like we have a meaning to life, if, or if our life feels like it's meaningless, I mean, look at the the vast majority of the population you know that they that that a lot of them don't have that meaning to life they don't they're they're just going through the motions and stuff and they have you know they're prescribed all these different uh medications for 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 these different mental illnesses or emotional illnesses but it's really if they would get down and find what their purpose is what what sets their soul on fire that would like alleviate a lot of these problems that they're having so Mm -hmm. one of the things i one of the things I like to do uh, in, in helping people find their purpose is I like to ask them, um, and, and, and a lot of this different stuff is coming from different things that I've I've learned either from my mentors or uh, from certain books that I've read or certain seminars that I've attended, uh, and I just piece all these puzzles together, and it's really helped me out. But I, I like to ask people though, uh, what what would you want your your family, friends, and coworkers uh, and people that you, you, you associate to say about you, about your character, contributions, and achievement in life at your funeral. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, and for a moment there, you know, you're going to touch on some of your deep, fundamental core values in life. Uh, that's You're touching on the true meaning, your true definition of success. A lot of times we're caught up, you know, in doing all these different things that we think is success, but the real definition of success is what, what kind of legacy do you want to leave behind? You know, and, and that kind of helps put things into perspective, as you would say. Um, and, and another thing I like I like to do with people is uh, when when you're when you're doing this when you're doing that visualization experience, like get detail with it. You know, like uh, really see yourself at your funeral. You know, and people talking about giving the their eulogy of your life and stuff. What, what do you want them to say about you? Like that's your legacy that you're leaving behind. It isn't just about, you know, a lot of people think of success and, and, and stuff as a, a monetary goal and stuff. And yeah, you, you know, money's part of it. You got to have money to live and there's nothing wrong with wanting to be rich and wealthy and live that lifestyle. But a purpose should be the service that you're given to, 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 to other people, something that you're contributing to society uh, it's got to be bigger than yourself. That's how I see a purpose, and that's w- one of the ways that I like like to hone in is to think about those, and and just know that your purpose is. It, it may take a while to find it, and also once you find it, it may it's going to evolve as you go. Like I know when I found my purpose in that jail cell, for instance, realizing I was going to miss out on my sons, I knew what my purpose was right then and there. But it has grown so much. Right. And just the two and a half years since, and it's evolved and, and it's even changed. Like I thought for a minute I was going to do network marketing for the rest of my life. I'm not even doing that anymore, but I'm still helping people. I'm still like doing the same thing in a different way. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's, I think that's absolutely correct. I mean, we've talked a lot about purpose on the show before. And one of the things that I, I'm always careful to point out um, is that, you know, if you're listening and, and, you're frustrated because you're not you haven't found this sort of overarching one life, you know, master purpose yet. You know, I don't think that's worth being frustrated over it because I think that a lot of people, myself included, sort of sort of pick up multiple, you know, purposes uh, for the word we're using, you know, over over different seasons and, and periods of their life. You know, I I don't view myself as having sort of this one overarching life purpose. I've had you know, several over the last, you know, couple, uh, you know, decade and a half or so now. And I think I'll continue to to have more or, you know, in your case, like you said, it can be constantly, um, constantly evolving. But, you know, I like what you said about the eulogy. I, I've actually, um, I, I'll have to find it, but probably two or three years ago, I actually sat down and did exactly what you're saying. And I literally, I typed out my own eulogy like this this is the kind of things I put it in quotes and everything like that I would want people um, to say about me and if you're listening I'd recommend you know maybe do that maybe pull up uh, the the notes app on your phone really quick and take like five minutes 
and just start typing out what you would want people to say at your funeral. Like I know it's a bit more morbid and stuff, but it really does make you think. Um, you start to ask yourself questions like, "Will would people actually say this now? You know, what could I be doing today to make sure people say this?" But yeah, it puts things in perspective, man. And 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 then once you have that. You start evaluating what you're doing right now. Like I love that. Uh, kind of also reminds me of that Steve Jobs quote uh, where he says, uh, "For the past 33 years, I look myself in the mirror every day and ask myself if this was my last day. Am I doing what I what I'd want to be doing? And yep. if the answer is no, too many days in a row, he'd change it. Like y- you could really put things in perspective that way. Like if this is how I want people to, what I want them to say about my character, contributions, and achievement in life." Am I acting in accordance to what I want them to say? You know, yeah. so it's a great, great exercise, man. Yeah, and something else I wanted to point out, which you've mentioned several times, um, whether you've realized it or not, is is so much meaning in our life. I feel like comes from the relationships around us. You know, just like we've talked about um, with with you know your sister and and your your kids. You know, those those relationships sort of caused. Um, some very pivotal moments in your life. You know, you mentioned you wrote your book, Prison to Promised Land, because a friend inspired you. You mentioned mentors. I mean, it is it is so important to surround yourself with with people that inspire you and cause you to to grow somehow and and to foster great relationships with friends and, and especially family. And I think, you know, so relationships, I mean, when it really comes down to it, relationships and other people is sort of the it's sort of the core of, of you know, all good and bad things that happen to you eventually. Um, all money, all opportunity, for instance, um, that you experience in your life can somehow be traced back to people and relationships. And so, um, but the other thing, and I don't mean to to go on. We'll go back to you in a second. You're just you're opening up a gr- a bunch of great um, points here that we don't get to talk about that often. But again, with this book, you know, the subtle art. I I remember he brings up this point that everybody's sort of searching for what pleasures they want out of life. Like we talk about, you know, what's your purpose and what's your meaning and kind of attached to that as we're trying to figure that out. We're thinking like what sort of, you know, what sort of happiness and pleasure do I want out of life? Um, And he said a better question to, to ask even than that is what sort of pain do you want out of life? Because in a roundabout way to, to really build a meaningful life, to really, um, yeah, build, anything, even develop some relationships and find happiness. Like you're, you know, you have a, a journey to go through and a lot of work, you know, hard work to do. Um, and so it's asking your, yourself basically what sort of hard work, uh, what sort of hard work do I want to do? I mean, he talks about wanting to be a rock star. Um, and, <laughs> and all he really, he found out all he really wanted was to actually just be on stage. He wanted the end result of being a rock star, not all the pain and the work that it takes, um, you know, to get there. And so that's a better question to ask is what sort of pain (laughs) do I want? It's really, really interesting. I mean, for you, Zachary, I know, you know, with your uh, Facebook, you know, advertising agency and what you're doing, like it takes a lot of work to become sort of an influencer, um, build a community and stuff. Um, That takes hard work and, and some failure and stress and stuff. But obviously that's sort of the problem and the type of problem, the type of pain, like you've chosen to, to take on as part of, you know, pursuing your, your overall purpose. Dude, you hit that right on the money there. Like that's a great, like, instead of saying what, what kind of joys and, and happiness do I want to like, what kind of pain do I want? What, what kind of, what am I willing to go through to get what I want? You know, that's mm-hmm. a great way to put that, man. Yeah. And it's not out of like, I'm not trying to be morbid or anything for anybody listening or, you know, this isn't meant to, you, you know, don't think about it negatively it's just a different way to ask the question because a lot of people they say like this is the type of life i want this is the type of purpose i want but the 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 journey to get there is not uh what they want and if you ask yourself kind of the converse of the question like what what pain do i want sort of you know what sort of hardships do i really want to go through that'll help you give you a little bit more direction on what you're probably gonna you know stick with as far as you know a new a new venture goes or something like that but um, anyway, so I, I'd be curious though to hear, you know, as far as your entrepreneurial journey nowadays, like how how that's going. I mean, if you've had any recent sort of successes or you know disappointments 
in, in the context of the, the overall journey here. And, and it'd be interesting also to hear kind of your, your longer term vision, where you hope to, to end up. Absolutely, man. And, uh, I just put up a post, uh, the other day, actually it was yesterday talking about, I was giving a, a telling a little bit of my story, but I was saying I fail more in one day than most people that I know fail in, a, in, in months. And, and I mean that, uh, cause I'm always, I'm always taking shots and I'm, figuring out what does work and what doesn't work and and correcting course as I go, like literally figuring this stuff out as I go. Um, if you wait to to know how to do everything that you want to do to actually act and do it, you're never going to do it. Like, do you, do you think like me coming out of prison, like I knew, oh, I'm going to be an entrepreneur and I'm going to run this business. I'm going to be a life coach. I'm going to, I'm going to have a Facebook ads agent. I don't, I didn't know none of this, you know, and I right. still don't know. I still don't know a lot of it. You know, I'm figuring out a lot of it as I go. Uh, and that's what entrepreneurship is, is, is yep. literally getting an idea, putting, putting it to test it out and, and, and correcting courses you go and learning from your mistakes. So, Definitely. Uh, and, and to go into that, so like more my 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 uh, vision with this right now, I, I have the Facebook ads uh, ad- advertising agency. I have the, the life coaching, uh, the speaking, ha- have the book. Where I want to go with this, though, is uh, uh, Gary Vee has been a huge impact in my life, an influence in my life. I know he has a lot of people. Uh, but that's my number one passion is speaking. Uh, I love, I, I, (laughs) this is a funny story. Uh, I I left it out. I used to be a a gangster rapper when I was growing up. (laughs) (laughs) Is there uh, anything we can find on YouTube at all? (laughs) (laughs) Thank God, no. (laughs) No, I was, uh, I was 11 years old and Eminem was out and he was like my idol when I was, when I was young and and I wanted to, wanted to be the next Eminem and, and all that. But, uh, that's that stemmed back from when I was a, even before I, I was doing the rapping when I was 11 and stuff. When I was a kid, like literally in kindergarten and first grade and all that, I'd always visualize myself on this stage in front of like thousands of people. And, and like, and I guess it stems from not having a father and wanting to be liked by everybody, but everybody was liking what I was, what I was saying and doing and stuff. And mm-hmm. I always had that vision. So then I guess w- that carried to the music aspect of it because you got to perform and stuff like that. And then, and now, uh, you know, me personally, I just don't, I I don't listen to rap music anymore. I'm not saying it's all bad, but most of it's just not my style anymore. It doesn't fit with my core values that I have in life. And uh, right, and a lot, and a lot of it, I just can't simply understand it. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> what kind of music do you listen to now? Then, just out of curiosity. <laughs> Honestly, I, I sound like an old man, and I'm only 28 years old. But I listen to a lot of audio books most of the time. Uh, but the, when <laughs> I do. Jam- right when, when I do jam out, though, I do jam out and, and every every now and then. I listen to like. Fallout Boy, uh, uh, more more of an alternative rock kind of style. Whenever I'm in the gym and stuff, and I, when I'm trying to, you know, right get on. get get amped up. But uh, likewise, man. Yep. <laughs> right on, right on. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, man. Uh, so that that's where I want to go with this. Is I, I want to be a transformational speaker. I hate the word motivational speaker, and I'll tell you why. Motivation. <laughs> is is crap man it comes and goes it's here one day and it's gone the next you know it's good when you got it but it's not gonna last you know but uh discipline that's the process of building habits and we're creatures of habits so i i i I like to teach processes and and ways of self-discipline that actually last so i call myself a transformational speaker not a motivational speaker but uh that's where i want to get to i want to get to on that level where i'm doing keynotes all the time and I want to build a media agency like like Gary Vaynerchuk has, where I'm, I'm providing services to other entrepreneurs that want to market their message or products, and uh, also uh, marketing my own message and product and, and stuff to the world. Yeah, well, that's awesome, man. I think uh, you know, I think you're doing a good job, and you're you're well on your your way to that. Um, so at the beginning of at the beginning, uh, kind of you know, pre start starting the show here, we were talking about sort of your dropout experience. And, and, uh, so maybe tell us just a, briefly a little bit about that. Cause I, you know, I thought that was a little bit of an, uh, an interesting story. You did earn your GED, right? Yeah. So, I mean, like literally school, man, I, I, 
I'm not stupid. All right, I'm not the smartest person in the world, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm not stupid. I just I cannot give something my attention if it's just like dull and doesn't it doesn't excite me. And if I know it's not going to have any practical use to my life, like when you're teaching me about the history of the of the West and all this stuff that they teach in school, like it for me. For me personally, that has no practical use in my life because I don't care about the history of, of, of the of – the, like I can't use that in a practical day right. of work or anything I got going on. It just doesn't make any sense, ne- nor does pre-algebra or calculus or anything. I have a calculator if I can't figure out a problem myself. I'm not trying to be a mad scientist or anything, you know? Right, right. So, now, if you're going to school to be a doctor or a lawyer or somewhat some, something of that nature, then yeah, that's great, and, and that's a place for you. But for me personally, being an entrepreneur and what I'm doing, formal education had served me no purpose. Uh, not not to say that I don't educate myself because I'm very big on education. Self education is huge. Like I, I learn mostly from experience, you know, actually doing stuff, but from the books I read, from other mentors, learning from their like. Education is everything, you know, but, but, but the formal thing was just not for me. And I ended up, uh, it, it started off in, in third grade. I just quit going to school and I always skip, you know, I was smoking the weed, you know, I was trying to fit in, be the bad kid, be the guy that I really wasn't. Did you say in third grade? Yeah, I know, right? It's horrible. <laughs> 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 right. It was, I was, I was a, I was a knucklehead, man. But, uh, but yeah, man. And I, I, I would, and when I was forced to go, I would go and I would sleep during class. You know, I just I just couldn't hold my attention. And, and eventually, you know, when I was in the juvenile uh, centers, I was in uh, DYS, and um, I was I had an opportunity to get it, and I didn't have anything else to do while I was there. I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna get this out the way when I'm 16. When I'm here, I'll take it. I did it in three months, studied for it, and passed the GED after being out of school literally since third grade. Literally, never not learning anything, but. I nice. studied it for, for for three months and got it out the way, and then that was it. That was that was the end of my uh, education <laughs> for formal yeah. education. Yeah, I mean it's it, it it's really interesting, you know what what you were saying earlier about you know curiosity. I mean, it's just you weren't studying any anything in school that you were innately uh, curious about, and I think right. I think that sometimes attributes to a lot of people's lack of, of finding meaning in their life is because, you know, I was lucky enough to be homeschooled and, and surrounded by other homeschoolers and, and just have in general the freedom, enough freedom growing up to be able to be more self-directed than I think, you know, my average peer growing up. And, and honestly, maybe dropping out in the third grade or just kind of checking out in the third grade, you know, might have might have uh, saved you in some ways because it's. <laughs> I, I noticed that when you know when I talk to a lot of people that have sort of been in the formal schooling system from you know K through twelve and then on into college and stuff, um, you know they're sort of innately dissatisfied and unhappy with their situation and how they're just going through the motions and they they want to drop out, but at the same time they have no idea what they want to do. Like there's no there's no like sense of of purpose or meaning or like this or you know they don't even know what they're innately curious about enough to to pursue it if they do decide to drop out and so i think that's one of the sort of the dangers of if you're involved in in a system like that you just sort of get used to digesting what's what you're fed your your entire life and it leaves very little room to actually you know do some introspection look inside yourself and figure out what exactly you're innately curious about, what sort of meaning you want to uh, attach to your life. And so. Dude, totally, man. And I, if I could expound on that, uh, go, yeah. go off on that a little bit. That, you, dude, that is so on point there. And, and I feel like, you know, uh, a lot of the, a lot of these kids going straight into college at 18 and 19 and stuff like did you know your life purpose at that age? I mean, if you did, awesome. No. But <laughs> but most people don't, you know. And and going and going to school because mommy and daddy tell you this is what you need to do. You need to be like dad and be a lawyer when you're really a freaking app developer or or a mm-hmm. musician, whatever. That's 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 just racking up debt and putting yourself in a miserable situation because you're not going to be happy doing it. 
and, uh, and, and then you're also putting yourself in debt that a lot of people can't climb out of because a lot of people go in to get these certain degrees and stuff in areas that they're not even passionate about. And then when they get done with school, they can't even find a job in that area that they that they went to school for, that they had the degree in. And now they got all this debt, so now they're thinking about getting going to get even more education to possibly <laughs> get a, another job. So maybe I'll work you know, a, a part-time job and put myself even further in debt in hopes of getting this, this other thing. So it's, it's really risky. I feel like, you know, I feel like that's the wrong time to be going to college is 18, 19. I feel like you should go and experiment in different fields and find, fi- if you haven't found your purpose yet, find what feels right, what, what you could do for the rest of your life before you really go and fully commit a hundred thousand dollars in debt and all this stuff to get those degrees. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I'd say definitely if you're listening and you're not sure what you want to do, but you're about to go and spend a lot of uh, debt trying to figure it out in college, um, that's something you should probably uh, probably avoid, and you should, you, should uh, <laughs> you know get clear on get clear on what you want to do before you start you know bracking up uh, student loans. But um, yeah, you're right, it's it's pretty amazing. I I have people that even reach out today who are you know in their late twenties or early thirties who are just sort of now waking up to, to, to realize what they're innately curious about and what they, you know, really want to do with their lives. But they've spent their whole lives up until that point just sort of doing what's what's expected and what sort of the societal norms are. And because of that there's a lot of unchecked boxes on the on the bucket list, you know. And so Definitely, it's, dude. it's yeah, it's so important. I'm not saying for people listening that you know, you you have to drop out right away. I mean, it's it's a big decision to make, and and you know, listen to some more episodes here, and definitely make an educated decision. But by all, like, I can't stress enough. Just you know, make sure you're taking time to just you know, not you know, you don't have everything just spoon fed to you. Make sure you're taking time to actually look inside yourself and and find out what you are innately curious about and what sort of meaning is. Yeah, like, are you an app developer, or are you a, a lawyer, or are you a doctor, or are you an entrepreneur, or something that doesn't even <laughs> exist yet? I mean, a lot of jobs that exist today, <laughs> you couldn't even, um, you know, nobody even knew about four years ago. So, right. Yeah, it's, it's great stuff, man. Well, um, can you tell us a little bit about your book? Let's do a little plug there. You know, is it just sort of a, a memoir, like a sort of your story and lessons learned or, and, and where can people find that? For sure. Uh, so, so the book, I wrote that I wanted to make it like a, a two part kind of deal. And this is before I even read, uh, uh, a man's search for meaning by Victor Frankl. It's kind of like his book in a sense. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of weird, but it's not, I, it's totally different. Of course, he went through some extreme, extreme, extreme stuff, but, uh, it's set up where I give out my autobiography, up until that point in my life of uh, I, I wrote it la- last summer, uh, 2016. I finished it in August. It took me a month and a half to write. So it was a autobiography up until that point of all like the real major factors in my life, everything that you've heard today, plus other stories of growing up and uh, experiences that I went through that really had an impact on me that I could remember. And then the second part, I give. Uh, at that time, my five-step process uh, for, for success, uh, for to find happiness and success in life, and uh, it, it's I've gotten a lot of great feedback on it because it's a, a, a quick read. It's 90, 90 something pages, I'll, and I'll be honest here too. It's funny. Uh, like I said, I just figure this stuff out as I go. I'm not an author or nothing. I didn't even finish school, but uh, right. it's ninety-six pages long, and I made it in big print. Uh, so it's not like huge, huge print, but it's uh bigger than normal so it's like a really easy read and that's that's like the feedback i've been getting on it and uh and people like though the the fact that it was uh it would this the story aspect of it they they like like that and like the the, <laughs> the 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 teachings and stuff from it but but my goal with that though i want to uh i'm actually wanting to add on to it i, I kind of want to go back because you know you, you you write this a year ago and you're like well wow man i could add this stuff that I've learned now and put that in there. So I don't know. That's up in the air. It's not for sure, but it's on Amazon. You can check it out there, or you can also uh, check it out on my website at uh, winwithzack.com. Sweet. That's awesome, man. And uh, 
you know, we're we're coming to the end here, and there's a couple questions I'd like to ask at the end. But real quick, I it seems like the biggest theme around this episode has been around sort of finding your finding meaning, uh, pursuing meaning in life, finding your purpose. And we've talked about a couple of ways, and I'm wondering if if you and I can't uh, just find a few more to throw out there. You know, I know the the one thing that you mentioned is is to think about your your funeral. You know, think about your eulogy and use that as sort of a tool to uh, find out, you know, begin with the end in mind. What do you want people to, to say about you? And then, you know, you've already mentioned another one, which is just, you know, trying things. Um, don't just be, you know, get get off the conveyor belt and, and go and try things. Pursue all your, you know, different interests while you're young, preferably. And, uh, you know, it takes time, but eventually... Um, you know, like you have, you know, Zach, you'll, you'll sort of find and, and settle into something that you really provides you with a lot of meaning. Um, just wondering if there's any other sort of tips we can throw out there for people to continue to uncover that for themselves. Yeah. And, uh, it's, it's really got to be something that you got to give real co- a lot of consideration and thought to obviously because it's, it's your life and your in your purpose and stuff and this is going to be something that you're going to be doing for the rest of your life and and if you feel lost and, and all that i mean ask yourself those questions you know write down these impressions that you're getting from asking yourself about the funeral type uh questions and uh you know it, it's just it, it really it, it, you can't stress too much about trying to find it you know or put too much mm-hmm. pressure on yourself about clarifying your purpose because when it comes down to it you got to enjoy the now the moment right now and a lot of times it's going to unfold as you go through things it's not going to yeah. all come to you right away so don't stress too much about it like obviously be searching for it and have that as a goal and, and ask yourself these questions but if you don't come up with it like that it's not the end of the day don't put too much stress on yourself to to force it out yeah, I mean, a- action begets more action. People have heard me say that on the show several times. It's like you can't just sit around and, and be in your own head and try to figure it out there. You do, you know, sometimes it's not clear until you're actually taking steps forward. Um, and, and more and more will will and for, fold. So, you know, definitely something to, to keep in mind. I, I find like two questions I've asked myself that help sometimes is, you know, one, I at least in terms of maybe finding purpose or direction right now. Um, one question I've asked myself before is what did I want to be when I was a kid before anybody yeah. else sort of had, you know, told me what to do um, or told me that it was unrealistic or, um, you know, before I was too uh, maybe indoctrinated or jaded and by, I don't know, just societal pressure or, or norms or, or the media or whatever. Um, and the other thing is, let's say, you know, you get a billion dollars today or we can say something more, you know, like maybe 10 million, um, you know, after, after all, after you get all the the partying and you buy all the toys and take the vacations and stuff, after you get all that out of your system, what, what would you do with that money to actually provide some meaningful value back to the world? Um, you know, how would you help others with that money? Um, what would make you feel like motivated to kind of get up every day and use that money for good? And so that's another question I've often asked um, that helps me clarify um, a bit more. But yeah, no, that's a great that's a great question right there, too. Yeah, I I guess I think like Zach said, though, the biggest thing is to just, you know, don't stress out if you don't have it all figured out now. But the thing is to just most important thing is to keep wrestling with it. You know, I, I have pages and pages of on in my journal and on, you know, word documents and stuff of just sort of brain dumping uh, the, these ideas and figuring it out as I write and as I, you know, sort of go through life. And so it's, it's a definitely an ongoing process. Um, the, the point is to just keep on, you know, keep on uh, uh, searching for that. Um, so the last couple of questions I have for you, uh, Zach, before I let you go, um, just, you know, any, do you have any parting advice for um, any of our listeners who are thinking of dropping out of, of school to pursue like a, uh, a job or some sort of venture or idea, um, but they haven't quite made that step yet? Um, any parting advice for those people? 
Absolutely. So this is kind of contradicts itself in the same sense, but it also makes perfect sense, at least to me. But uh, if you're thinking about, you know, if you're not, if you're second guessing the, 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 the college course that you're in or whatever, and there's something else that's driving you, that's pulling you, that you're being pulled towards, more than likely you are still pretty young if you're, if you're in college. You have your whole life ahead of you. This is the time to make mistakes, to, to really to shoot as many shots as you can at life and figure it out what it is that you're meant to do. Yep. And and really, when it all comes down to it, yeah, I said, said this is the time to make those mistakes because you have your whole life ahead of you. But at the same time, life is too short, even like and I'm only 28, so I don't really know how short it is, you know, but I know it, it, it goes it goes by fast mm-hmm. and you got to do, we only get one life. You know what I'm saying? We only get one shot at life. This isn't a practice round. This is it. So you got to do what makes you happy. And if you're being pulled towards something, if, if you have a, a drive because you want to work on, on creating this new software that really excites you, that you and your partners have been working on and talking about, or you have this idea to do whatever, this certain business model, whatever it may be, Go and do it. Give it a try. You know, the worst, what's the worst, ask yourself this, what's the worst thing that can happen? I, you know, ask, literally, what's the worst that can happen if you right. if you go and try this? The worst that can absolutely happen cannot hurt you. It just wouldn't happen, which if you didn't try it, wouldn't happen anyways. Mm-hmm. And the best that could happen is it comes through for you. Then after that, ask yourself, or then realize that, you have nothing to lose and everything to gain. So, so take those shots. Keep taking the shots. You're going to miss a lot. You're going to fail a lot, uh, but you're going to learn a lot if you if you if you can handle handle the failure. You know that's that's part of it. You know, and if you can't handle failure and you're you're too scared because like we'll, we all get scared, everybody, me included. Uh, I, I, but if you can't face those fears and you can't deal with the fear of failure and all that, then you're not cut out to be an entrepreneur. Simple and plain, because that's yeah. part of entrepreneurship. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I I, to- I totally agree with that. There's a really uh, Tim Ferriss talks about an exercise called fear setting that really has helped me in times where I sort of have a I'm at a crossroads. But you know, as as, a, as an example, say you're uh, you're you're either thinking of you know say finishing your degree or maybe starting this this business venture, which is a lot more scary and a lot more risky. You know, asking yourself what's what is the worst that could happen. Or what? What would be the cost? I guess what would be? Ask yourself what would be the cost of not pursuing um, this opportunity. Um, and <laughs> at least for me, at the end of the day, if I've been at a crossroads like that, it's the, usually the answer is that you know if I don't pursue this opportunity, I am potentially trading a uh, on a scale of one to ten, like a like a seven to nine uh, permanent positive outcome. You know, if I pursue this, it works out. Um, and it, it's a successful business, or even if I pursue it and it doesn't work out, I've learned a lot and possibly more opportunities arise from there. I'm possibly trading that outcome, which is a, a, a say an eight to eight to 10 positive permanent outcome for a, a potential, you know, four to five, uh, temporary negative uh, outcome, you know, if you don't, if you don't succeed in in one business, you know, it's like you you can always bounce back from that. It's not like you're gonna, you know, if you lose all your money, it's not like you're not gonna have money for the rest of your life. Like you'll make some money back. It's that's typically only temporary, a temporary temporary negative outcome. And so, you know, I don't know if that makes much sense, but it's it's typically, you know, it's typically helped me doing that fear setting exercise go down. Um what is typically the scarier road, but has the more, more of a potential for a permanent positive, uh, payoff. And I'll, I'll put a link to a more thorough explanation in the show notes. Cause I know that's kind of confusing, but the last question I have for you, you know, Zach is what uh, advice do you have for any of our listeners who have already dropped out and who are maybe where you are, um, who are already on their entrepreneurial journey, any parting advice there? Yeah, just keep doing it. Keep going. There's going to be days where you you almost feel like you get burnt out. You're not totally burnt out because you're if you're doing what you really love and your purpose in life, there is no such thing as getting burnt out, I believe. But there's going to be days where you get worn out. Like uh, literally for the past, 
a good example here for the past almost two months I was in the middle of getting a bunch of this new the, the new businesses launched and I was working on so many things and this has really taught me that I need to start delegating I need to I need to get a team uh, built now so that's where I'm at. at but I was literally staying up till two to four in the morning and getting back up at, at no later than eight or eight thirty uh, for almost two months and, and literally burning myself out and I don't care what nobody says. You, you need to get sleep. You know that's part of uh, being healthy and being functional. And, and you, you just function so much better when you have a good eight hours of sleep every night. And uh, so I was getting worn out, and I was like, "Oh man!" But you just keep putting, keep keep tearing at it uh, day by day, brick by brick, uh, and it keeps getting better. And and w- you know when you when you do little, when you focus on a bunch of these small things, doing over and over repeatedly. You know, you're you're building, you're actually wiring your brain for success because you you you're constantly having all these success, and then you can remember these small successes when you're getting ready to go do something that you're unsure of. Literally, right. visualize the old the old. Uh, I've read this, and I think it was Psycho Cybernetics he, how he talks about this. But you you visualize that old successful feeling, and, uh, the winning feeling is what he calls it actually. And, and you feel it, you know that old success. Then you start thinking about what you want to do and accomplish in your next goal, as if as if it was. How would you feel as if you already achieved it? And that has been really powerful for me. Like for instance, when I do podcast interviews like this, for instance, like before, I used to be scared to get on there, you know, and, and, and <laughs> it, it was frightening, you know, to to just be talking to so, someone and they're asking you questions and you're on the spot and none of this stuff is like really rehearsed. Really, it's like I'm just on the fly, <laughs> right. I would visualize those like answering questions confidently and talking about stuff that I already know that I've been through and experienced and delivering it in a concise message where people can receive it and benefit their lives. And it, and it's, it, it works. It's like, it's crazy, man. So use that winning uh, feeling in, in like whenever you're going about these new things that you never done before and constantly every day, if you do, if you have two days that are the same in entrepreneurship, then you're not doing it right. You got to get out of your comfort zone and be doing things that you've never done before and be all over the place and learning until you get to that point where you can build the team up and start delegating and focusing on the, on the solely the creative side. Right, right on, man. That's a good word. And in regards to the, the, uh, podcasting i I think your tactics working you're you're doing pretty well (laughs) right on me that's that's worked for you uh but anyways man what's the best way that people can uh, connect with you best way i my website is winwithzack.com and i'm on uh youtube where i put out my best videos i put up three videos a week where i'm teaching everything that i know that i've used in my life that's helped me uh through personal development that's win with zach um, on YouTube. And that, that's where you can find me. I'm also on Facebook as well, but those two are the main spots. Awesome. Well, successful dropouts, you are the average of the five people you hang around the most and you've been hanging out with Kylan and Zachary. Then I think we're, I think we're pretty cool <laughs> learning what it <laughs> yeah. takes to drop out, grind and succeed for everything we talked about today. Head over to successful dropout.com and type Zachary uh, into the search bar and the show notes will pop right up. And as always stay hungry Stay foolish. <laughs>